Right. It's been recorded, yeah. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in which part of the world. This morning and afternoon, we have an interesting topic. It's a unilateral vocal cold paralysis. Now, whether it is a paralysis or immobility is something that you need to decide first. I started doing ENT in 1960 when there was no technical advances. And I set out my own way of dealing with unilateral vocal cord palsy. So what it is, is I think it's immobility is the right word for it rather than palsy. Palsy is one of the causes of immobility. <coughs> so as we as the time progressed from 1960 onwards, we change the terminology and we don't call that as palsy now. Palsy is one of the factors of uh, immobility. So what we want to do is define first what we are going to talk about this, this morning. What we're going to talk about is <coughs> vocal cord paralysis or palsy and what do you do with it? So to start with, I worked it out for myself a long time ago that if it's a right vocal cord paralysis, then I think it's straightforward laryngeal and neck problem here. If it is left side vocal palsy, then you need to go into the chest and gastric uh, stomach as well. The reason is the left recurrent nerve, laryngeal nerve, is given out after the vagus goes into the thorax, as we know. Therefore, to start with, you have the differentiation between left vocal cord palsy and a right vocal cord palsy. Now, all the pathology that affects the right vocal cord palsy also affects the left vocal cord palsy, all that pathology. But in addition, pathology in the mediastinum affects the left recurrent nerve uh, because it goes into the chest and then it comes out. So that's the first differentiation that we have to do. Once you know that it's a right cord palsy, palpate your neck and everything else, and particularly there's a gland here in supraclavicular area on both sides. On the left side is called Varkau gland. It's in supraclavicular. And sometimes the chest cancer or carcinoma of uh, bronchus and uh, pulmonary carcinoma can actually involve that node. And that node then can cause recurrent nerve paralysis. So that's the only relation of the right side. But Parkow node is on the left side, but similar node exists on the right side as well. So once you have decided it's a left cord or right cord palsy, if it's left cord, you have to go through the chest and all that to rule out other causes than local causes. Now, what are the local causes for recurrent nerve palsy? Well, the main cause is we don't know. That's the idiopathic. Idiopathic forms about 40 or 50 percent of uh, vocal cord palsy uh, in, in both on both sides. So once you have ruled out everything else, then it becomes a unilateral vocal cord palsy or vocal fold palsy. So the next common cause has to be thyroid right. surgery. Thyroid surgery. Thyroid surgery causes a lot of damage to recurrent laryngeal nerve. In old days, it was common, very common. But now we got nerve stimulator and everything else and advanced technology. Therefore, that causes much less now than idiopathic. So apart from that, I also divide the approach to knowing about the palsy in two ways. One is the neurological cause, which we talked about just now. And second is the structural cause. Structural cause is in the cord, in the vocal fold not in the neurological neuro, nerve supply. What is the structural cause? It could be chondroma. It could be 
joint uh, art uh, artino uh, cryogenic joint fixation or it could be early ca or it could be subglottic stenosis so these are structural causes not neurological causes so these are the differentiation that you do to start with and then you deal with the paralysis for whatever reason they are doing it. so there are three symptoms of paralysis that patient comes with first of course is due to voice and second is due to difficulty in breathing sometimes and third symptom may be aspiration so these are three symptoms that the patient comes and then you have to put priority of his symptoms the priority of symptoms is this aspiration there's no doubt that you need to do something about it so this is how you form the basis of how to do how to deal with your case i think this basis will never change it will always remain the same whatever technology advances there are but now we go to uh uh brandon first now brandon does a need introduction but uh, he is in university of chicago and his interest lies in laryngology all aspects of laryngology and uh, he has got loads of uh, cv one of his cv is uh, of course we worked at steve zeitel that's a good one and then you have an interest in singer's voice so naturally your input is quite important and bill has started doing something different he is injecting self protein into the vocal cord now what is the difference between self protein and calcium dietary uh, hydroxy appetite with that we use the difference is this the ch it gets absorbed and travels to a lymph node and therefore you find over a period of time it has migrated into the lymph node and therefore the results may be decreasing over the period of time as against that the self protein stays for a long time where it is time will tell us how long it stays there but that's an interesting development because one of the problems of uh, uh, doing the medialization is some cases don't last as long as we would like to and maybe this ans- this uh, self protein may be the answer with all this introduction uh, i just need to tell about uh, brigadier ramalingam brigadier ramalingam of course was an old timer <laughs> old timer means he's been long time 30 years of ent he was a brigadier in, in in armed forces medical college in india and in forces and then he is a lot of interest in uh, ent but mainly uh, we are we having him here for thyroplasty uh, so there's an internal fixation of uh, paralyzed cord and there's an external fixation of paralyzed cord so this is where ramalingam has traveled all over india and abroad demonstrating his techniques learning from his techniques as well we learned i learned from his technique quite a bit so so we got brigadier brigadier sir <laughs> well he's an army man you see respect him <laughs> thank you sir thank you yeah <laughs> and then sachin gandhi i think again compliment goes to sachin gandhi for arranging all this on a very big scale um He is, he is a head of the tertiary referral center head of the quaternary airway center as well he's got three scholars attached to his department they are recognized by royal college of surgeons of england which is unusual because rcs doesn't recognize outside but this place has been recognized uh, outside uh, uk and ireland but he's got three scholars and of course his department recognized as part of the recognition of the postgraduate center by royal college of surgeons of england 
since uh, 2014, I think, for a long time. So it is a big center. It's a nice center. So we got all the experts here. And I hope people all over the globe who are taking part in this webinar will uh, have something home to take and something to think about. So, Bill, uh, not Bill, first, uh, Brandon. Yes, thank you so Brandon, much for the... Your, your platform. Okay. Wonderful. I appreciate the introduction, Dr. Oswald, and congratulations to you again as well on the uh, recent oh. award. <laughs> you, yeah, uh, well, I'll just tell you about the award. Only last week, UK ENT, which is our professional body, they gave me an award of Lifetime Trainer Award, uh, Rowan Ryan Award. And I say people abroad always appreciate but they don't know anything about me they only know when i go there and lecture and everything the same thing for all you people but when you get recognition from your own colleagues who are jealous to start with who compete in private practice with you and put you down all the time you know <laughs> that happens for for 30 40 years after that they think oh, he is no competitor for us he has stopped private practice is waiting to die, you know. So give him the award. Maybe that's why I got the award. <laughs> well, I, I, I think I think we all think it's well deserved here. So uh, well, thanks. congratulations thanks, again. Um, and thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. And I also want to take this opportunity while I'm pulling up my slides to uh, to thank uh, Bill Gao, my partner, as well for joining here. Um, and you know, it's we're very very lucky to have him. Um, let me see. Actually, hold on one second. Um, there we go. So really quickly, just going to uh, speak a little bit about um, vocal fold, quote, par paralysis, as we've discussed it before, and specifically focus on idiopathic paralysis. Um, and um, essentially, a lot of what I'm going to say will probably be a little bit of deja vu from what Dr. Oswald uh, went through in his introduction. I was sort of charged with uh, talking about sort of evaluation uh, and we're going to leave management for Dr. Ramalingan, Dr. Gao, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Gandhi. So before we get into it too much, um, you know, the term paralysis, as Dr. Oswal said, um, sort of is not specific enough, is not general enough for what we want to talk about. So what we'll do is we'll sort of more talk about a framework for considering immobility rather than paralysis. And then we'll kind of go from there in terms of diagnostic management, but spend the majority of the uh, majority of the, the rest of the lecture addressing uh, management strategies for patients that have um, idiopathic neuronal injury. Um, so quickly, immobility is a general term that describes the uh, vocal fold movement abnormality. Um, typically, terms like paralysis, palsy, paresis were thrown around. However, immobility, hypomobility more accurately describes when you have a patient coming into clinic that has a uh, loss of, uh, of movement of the cord, paresis sort of uh, being synonymous with hypomobility. And as Dr. Oswald mentioned as well, there are a number of de uh, different potential ideologies that can cause an immobility of the vocal fold, iatrogenic, idiopathic, malignant um, fixation. And there is some degree of um, variability in terms of the incidence and prevalence in, in many studies. So it's very difficult to kind of um, to uh, to pin down an exact incidence or prevalence for, for these, these conditions. So when you're evaluating someone that has a vocal fold, um, quote, paralysis or immobility, the first step in, um, in the, the diagnostic the di diagnostic ladder is determining whether or not it is a fixation or if it's a true uh, paralysis or neuronal injury, um, recurrent laryngeal neuropathology. And as Dr. Oswald mentioned before, fixation, specifically limited mobility is secondary to mechanical limitation is an important concept to identify. And we'll get into later the use or benefit of EMG in that discussion, as well as operative um, suspension microlaryngoscopy to determine uh, the degree of mobility of the joint. But things that can cause that posterior glottic or subglottic stenosis, rheumatoid arthritis, iatrogenic injury, or dislocation of the arytenoid, as well as malignancy at the cricoarytenoid joint. So they're all, those are all things to keep in mind uh, with on, on your differential um, before you sort of automatically assume that it's a neuronal injury. But before we get into sort of the potential differential diagnosis, uh, we're going to talk uh, briefly about the neuroanatomy of the, um, the recurrent laryngeal nerve. 
And so, as you know, um, the afferents for the uh, vagus nerve come from the nucleus uh, ambiguous, as well as there are some afferents from the uh, cerebral cortex that uh, synapse with the lower motor neurons and, and create uh, most of the input into the vagus, which then turns into the recurrent laryngeal um, nerve. As you know, on the right, the, the recurrent laryngeal loops around the right subclavian, typically, and on the left, it loops around the arch of the aorta. Um, and it's important to know that uh, with uh, certain patients, the right rec rec recurrent laryngeal nerve is actually non-recurrent in about 0.2 to 0.8% of patients. And you'll also see a recurrent, uh, an abnormal right subclavian in those patients as well. <clears throat> and then with regard to the nerve uh, innervation of the muscles of the larynx, we know that the recurrent laryngeal innervates the TCA, the posterior cricorytenoid, the lateral cricorytenoid, the interretinoid muscles, as well as the thyroretinoid muscle, and, and uh, contributes to sensation below the gl glottis, as well as um, uh, the superior laryngeal nerve uh, innervates the cricopharyngeal, excuse me, cricothyroid muscle, and, um, and uh, provides sensation to the glottis as well. So briefly talking about etiology of vocal fold immobility. So a number of studies have looked retrospectively at a, a large uh, cohort of patients that have vocal cord paralysis or immobility and identified the following causes as sort of the leading uh, reasons for why these things develop. Um, Rosenthal in 2007 looked at 435 patients and identified 83% um, uh, uh, unilateral and 17% bilateral paralyses and found that iatrogenic, as Dr. Oswald mentioned earlier, was about 46.3% of those that presented, as well as um, idiopathic was about 176 and malignancy was about 13.5. The other causes were related to trauma, infection, inflammation, uh, intubation, et cetera. Spataro, similarly in 2014, reviewed 938 patients with unilateral cord paralysis and similarly found iatrogenic injury about 50% as well as uh, idiopathic injury of about 13.2% and malignancy about 17%. Uh, um, with regard to uh, iatrogenic injury, uh, as Dr. Oswald mentioned, the majority, overwhelming majority was related to endocrine, thyroid, and parathyroid surgery. However, there was a non non-insignificant amount of uh, uh, immobilities or uh, paralyses that were caused after, um, uh, that were caused after cardiac and lung surgery, as well as ACDF, um, and carotid surgery. Um, one second, sorry. Um, Skull-based surgery was also con a contributor to uh, immob immobility as well. Um, so with regard to the natural history of vocal fold immobility and the sort of the, the uh, prognosis for recovery, a great article by Ted Mao came out in 2017 looking at recovery and Sleek also uh, published an article looking at sort of the timeline for recovery um, in patients and found that um, in about 22% of patients, there was complete recovery of motion. And in about 20%, there was uh, any slight, slight recovery of motion. And 17%, there was about uh, complete recovery of voice and uh, uh, 22, any recovery of voice. And Ted Mao similarly looked at 70, 727 cases of idiopathic and iatrogenic vocal fold paralysis and found that about 13.2% had spontaneous recovery of their voice. An average recovery time was about 156 um, plus or minus 11 weeks. <clears throat> and there was a sort of non-normal distribution suggesting two mechanisms of vocal fold injury and recovery. And then finally, Lauren Tracy um, from Boston um, looked at uh, 923 uh, patients evaluating hydrogenic vocal fold paralysis over 10 years. And 60, excuse me, 76 patients had spontaneous recovery of mobility, which is about 15%, similar to what Ted Mao found. An average recovery time was 4.1 months. 20% of the cervical and 6.4% of thoracic injuries experienced uh, recovery. And this is really important uh, uh, kind of thing for us to identify because there are two uh, different groups, like a late stage and an early stage um, uh, prognostic recovery group. Um, and it's important to distinguish that when you're discussing management options. And I think that they'll, uh, the other talk uh, speakers will get into this a little bit later about making a decision about your uh, management options based on the time since the injury or time since the immobility started. So with regard to the clinical workup, as Dr. Um, Oswald mentioned as well, you want to make sure that you're paying close attention to the symptoms that come about. So obviously the vocal fold immobility comes along with a voice uh, disturbance, uh, but aspiration can also result as well as uh, subjective shortness of breath rela related to air escape. 
couple of things that have been uh, published on voice evaluation include uh, voice measures and uh, MPT being one of the most uh, significant measures because of the glottal insufficiency that's associated um, uh, with, uh, with the vocal fold immobility or paralysis, as well as a change in mean airflow and a change in the GRBAS scale um, perceptual measures. Uh, additionally, uh, OPM or uh, fees or the video fluoroscopic swallow studies demonstrated um, a significant dif difference in a study by Zhao in 2019 for patients that had a vocal fold paralysis. When you're seeing and evaluating a patient in clinic that you think might have a vocal fold paralysis or immobility, a couple of things to pay attention to from a symptom standpoint. The voice tends to be high pitched, tends to be breathy, there tends to be a significant amount of air escape. Uh, additionally, you'll tend to occasionally hear a perturbation of the mucosal wave, which sounds like a, a flag or a sail flapping in the wind or the breeze. And you'll occasionally hear some diplophonia as well. A study by Mete et al. Um, evaluated some of the most sort of clinically significant um, differences in sort of perceptual and acoustic measures that you'll see in patients that have unilateral paralysis. And they published it in an international consensus on basic voice ass uh, assessment for unilateral paralysis. And they found that um, uh, the uh, grade breathiness uh, scale in the GRBAS or the GRB scale um, demonstrated significant difference between pre and post-operative pa uh, patients with paralysis, BHI, maximum phonation time, and jitter were also significantly difference, different. So uh, they recommended using a sort of systemic way of kind of including this in your preoperative evaluation or pre-procedural evaluation. A number of people looked, have looked at strobal laryngoscopy for patients with vocal fold paralysis and identified a couple of different parameters that demonstrate significant difference after medialization. A couple of things to pay attention to with regard to strobe are the obviously the movement of the arytenoid, but also bowing of the cord, incomplete closure, aperiodic movement, aberrant mucosal wave, and then the perturbation as well. So a number of different things that you can kind of pay attention to with regard to your strobolaryngoscopy. Then EMG uh, has come out, come about and gained some favor over the past de couple of decades with regard to evaluation of, of vocal fold mobility. And a consensus statement in 2016 evaluated using laryngeal EMG for the diagnosis and treatment of uh, vocal fold paralysis. And they uh, demonstrated uh, in that study, or at least summarized in that study, that uh, motor unit potentials on laryngeal EMG increased the likelihood of recovery of the vocal fold uh, uh, paralysis by about 52%. Uh, Therefore, they suggested that a prognostic EMG between four and six weeks after the injury can be performed to determine um, the prognostic sort of um, um, the, the prognosis of recovery of the, the, of the nerve. That being said, um, we'll talk a little bit about the pitfalls, the benefits of EMG um, later and, and discuss sort of how it fits into, into some of the diagnostic um, kind of uh, workup. Cheng similarly used EMG to assess idiopathic versus iatrogenic vocal fold paralysis and found that EMG evidence of minor denervation in uh, idiopathic paralysis um, was a little bit less compared to the iatrogenic vocal fold paralysis. When it comes to laryngeal EMG, um, essentially it's similar to your Botox uh, laryngeal EMG uh, for, for um, therapeutic reasons. You're essentially placing a small needle EMG probe into the cricothyroid uh, space, into the, uh, the muscle of the, the uh, thyroarytenoid. Um, you're identifying whether or not there is a, a motor um, unit action potentials um, or fibrillation. Um, and that can help to distinguish whether or not there's actually uh, neuronal input to or um, nervous input into the, uh, the muscles of the larynx. Um, a study by Scott et al. in 29, uh, excuse me, 2009 evaluated six bugles that they um, created a recurrent laryngeal nerve injury in. Uh, four of them were crush injuries, uh, two of them were transaction injuries, and they performed laryngeal EMG uh, after these injury, injuries on pretty much a weekly basis. Fibrillation was present immediately after the injury, and they noted that the fibrilla fibrillation in the uh, transected group continued. However, the, um, uh, the crush injury group uh, started to demonstrate some evoked response, um, co coincident with the um, uh, vocal fold motion return. Uh, demonstrating that motor unit action potentials were present typically around five or six weeks or so, which is a reason why uh, doing EMG at that point can be helpful from a prognostic standpoint. 
And this little graph just demonstrates the difference between the fibrillations as well as the um, um, motor unit action potentials that we're seeing later on. So um, finally, uh, discussion of sort of how EMG fits into sort of the prognostic, but also the management algorithm. And, and, and people may get into this a little bit later, but it can be helpful in determining or at least prog prognosing what's going on. It can be helpful in determining whether or not there's a paralysis there versus a fixation and can be very helpful in bilateral immobility. But funeral lateral disease, it doesn't always change management for, for spontaneous Im uh, immobility. For instance, if your EMG demonstrates that there's neuronal injury, you're still going to do an injection laryngoplasty for neuronal injury or lack of neuronal injury. So it's really, um, in my practice, I don't use it typically for all of my patients, but there are some that use it to give their, their patients um, a sense of what the timeline will be for um, return, of, uh, return of function. And then finally, for bilateral immobility, it can be helpful to determine if there's a fixation on one side and an immobility on the other side related to a nerve problem. And that can help to guide you in terms of which side you choose to do the chordotomy or the partial retinoidectomy on. Finally, with regard to um, CT scan and imaging, um, there are a number of studies that have looked at the diagnostic yield and the benefit of getting a scan for patients that have a unilateral vocal fold paralysis. Um, in this study by uh, C. Kudas uh, in 2012, I didn't demonstrated a very high rate of malignancy in patients with a paralysis, but this was uh, basically contradicted by a, a study by Paddle in 2015 that evaluated 140, excuse me, 74 patients with unilateral vocal fold paralysis that had a contrast enhanced CT. Only five of them um, had a cause for quote paresis identified on the CT, yielding a 2.9 diagnostic yield. About 48%, excuse me, 48 of 174 had some other in incidental lesions that um, identified that yielded a 27.6 incidental yield. Um, and based on this, the cost benefit analysis pointed towards obtaining CTs scans uh, in unilateral vocal fold paralysis, as you all know. And it's really important when you're ordering these scans for you to evaluate your skull base all the way down through aorta, which isn't always done at a lot of radiology centers. Another study by uh, Noel et al. in 2016 retrospectively reviewed charts from 1998 to 2014, and they looked at 300, excuse me, 3,210 patients, um, and they found 207 patients that had idiopathic unilateral vocal fold paralysis. All of those patients were scanned at the time of the initial diagnosis to determine what the cause was for the idiopathic paralysis. Um, and they subsequently looked um, at uh, the patients five years out to determine if there was another uh, alternative diagnosis that was identified. And in eight of that 207 patients, they identified a different diagnosis. So basically 90% 90, 90 of them remained idiopathic at five years. However, for 10% of them, there was a subsequent um, malignancy that was identified, either papillary thyroid cancer, ipsilateral uh, piriform squamous cell carcinoma, uh, vocal fold squame, malignant uh, vagal nerve, uh, nerve sheath tumor or acidic cell carcinoma of the trachea. So it's really important in um, these studies to identify um, uh, what's going on with imaging, but uh, just because you get imaging and it's negative doesn't mean it's the entire story. There may be something that comes about later. So briefly in my last minute or so, we're gonna talk about uh, medical management uh, and I'll leave the procedural intervention to my, my co-presenters here, but specific, specifically with regard to medical management, vocal fold, voice therapy, excuse me, and then um, nimodipine have been sort of uh, indicated or discussed as options for patients with an unilateral immobility. Spontaneous re recovery of the voice usually recurs re within uh, six to nine months to a year. Um, Walden et al. in 2017 looked at the use of voice therapy in patients with vocal fold paralysis. And I always tell people that voice therapy doesn't necessarily uh, improve the um, return or the, the, the function of the vocal fold that's, that's immobile, but it can help patients compensate for the immobility that's there. Um, the studies that were evaluated were 12. And all of them showed some improvement in the voice following the use of voice therapy. The problem is there was no standardization in the intervention, no consistency of the assessment, and there were variable ideologies for vocal fold paralysis in these studies. So we don't really have a great understanding of the utility of voice therapy in these patients. And typically voice therapy is not um, as helpful as something like an intervention, like an injection laryngoplasty. Finally, in 20, um, I believe 17 was when it was first published, or maybe 14, um, Clark Rosen's group started using uh, nimodipine, a calcium channel blocker that was thought to be neuroprotective uh, in nerve injury by preventing intracellular calcium accumulation and then reducing cell death. 
um, a systematic review um, using the motopine and facial nerve and recurrent laryngeal nerve um, uh, injury was uh, published in 2018. And it demonstrated that uh, there was uh, an improvement in uh, vocal fold motion recovery in patients that were getting the motopine um, after their, um, after their, their vocal fold uh, injury. So it's a consideration. It's something that's worth maybe including in your armamentarium for patients that have um, uh, a vocal fold immobility while you're waiting for the nerve to recover. And the risks are pretty, pretty minimal, pretty, uh, pretty low. So with that, I'm going to sort of close up and sort of uh, hand it over to uh, my co-presenters. And again, thank you so much for your time. And thank you to Sachin Gandhi for um, uh, your, your hard work in helping to coordinate and, and, and organize all of this. So thanks so much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Bill. Right. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's been a real yeah. pleasure and privilege working alongside Dr. Baird, um, having transitioned from another uh, institution. And thank you, Dr. Oswald, Dr. Gandhi, everyone here on this esteemed panel. It's um, it's nice to be able to uh, participate in this with all of you. Let me share my screen here. Is this visible? Yep, you can see it. Uh, okay, great. So um, for my section, I'm gonna focus on the practice of office-based injection laryngoplasty and no disclosures. Just a quick overview of some of the topics we're gonna be talking about. The Really the hitting on the why, the when, the what, how do you do it, some pearls, pitfalls, and looking at outcomes um, with injection laryngoplasty. So first of all, as with most things, we have to ask ourselves, why do we even want to do it? Why do we want to incorporate this in our practice? Um, and specifically, we're talking about office-based awake injection and laryngoplasty. It's a versatile procedure and skill that uh, can be used to treat a large patient population, not just only that of patients with unilateral vocal fold immobility or paralysis, paresis, but also atrophy and other disorders of glottic insufficiency. Um, and for these patients, it really is a better treatment modality for the vast majority of them, as there are many advantages uh, over traditional injection laryngoplasty uh, operatively under general anesthesia. It avoids gen the general anesthesia as well as the risks that are associated with them. It's less risk for those patients with uh, medical comorbidities that put them uh, at risk uh, for anesthesia. It's easier logistically and coordination-wise for many of these patients to come to the office for this procedure that can have a fairly immediate uh, or short turnaround impact on their clinical uh, outcome and how they're just functioning from voice, airway, and swallowing standpoint. And uh, what I've found in my own practice is that many times there are superior outcomes uh, because you do have the benefit of the audio feedback um, in addition to visual feedback in terms of titrating your injection and degree of augmentation. And um, on the other side of things, it's also a more efficient use of your time and that you can then turn around and leverage to help more patients not having to wait on or turn around time um, and uh, the procedure, once you're more comfortable and facile with it, can actually be fairly uh, performed fairly quickly. So when do we consider office-based injection for our patients? Well, first off, um, I uh, indicate unilateral vocal fold paralysis here, but really it is really a more of an umbrella incorporating paresis, palsy or immobility, as Dr. Baird mentioned, or hypomobility, many of those patients fall under the same clinical phenotype uh, with impact on their voice and swallowing uh, aspirations. It is important that these patients are able to tolerate awake laryngoscopy to begin with, as if they, uh, if they poorly tolerate it, then it's going to be very challenging and unlikely to be successful. Some contraindications, some of which can be more relative contraindications, include impaired cognition, not being able to follow directions as 
it is a team effort procedure that requires um, the patient to uh, follow your commands. If they have a severe gag or cough reflex um, uh, during the process of laryngoscopy, that can be challenging to navigate, not completely um, an absolute contraindication, but certainly one that would uh, deter me from offering them an awake injection if it cannot be quelled with local anesthesia. And then also there's the important aspect of patient preference. You know, the, what we offer and what we guide patients in choosing in terms of treatment decision really has to keep the patient in the in the middle, patient-centric shared decision-making. So if they are anxious and really do not want to awake procedure, we have to respect and acknowledge that. And these are some pre and post procedure instructions that um, I personally offer patients. Uh, again, some of this may vary, um, and it's, you know this is not a uh, absolute. Everyone has slightly different preferences, but I, I'm okay with a patient's eating beforehand. Um, I just uh, usually inform them to keep it to a light meal to avoid any nausea. Again, not unreasonable to keep them in PO for a certain period of time before the procedure. Um, I also allow them to continue any anticoagulation. This practice is generally supported by the literature that's out there, um, but of course you can consider holding depending on the indipatient patient risk profile and risk tolerance. Um, typically, since it's only a needle poke for the injection, it's a relatively limited bleeding risk, and many of these patients are in anticoagulation for more serious cardiac or other risks. Um, I offer my patients an anxiolytic such as Valium that they can take about 30 minutes beforehand, but I will say the vast majority of my patients um, choose not to um, uh, take that as many of them also will uh, transport themselves, drive themselves, and um, do not wish to uh, take that. Um, afterwards, because of laryngotracheal anesthesia, um, and PO for about an hour and a half until it subsides, and voice rest for the day. They can usually resume voice use the next day. Over-the-counter analgesia is usually sufficient. So what do we need to be able to perform office-based injections safely and effectively? Well, we really have to think about safety first with all things that we do. Um, do no harm to the patient. So we have to make sure we've really thoughtfully um, uh, addressed uh, safety monitoring protocols. So taking vital signs before and after the procedure, if you have the capability to do it, certainly you can do continuous monitoring. That's not something we routinely do as um, the hemodynamic stability uh, does not, is not significantly impacted typically. Um, there's always a very rare risk of serious complications such as laryngospasm, generally not since you're using laryngotracheal anesthetic, but it is important to have a code cart available for this reason and um, uh, intubation equipment and staff should be familiarized with what is on the cart and how to access it. And there should be some plan that is arranged and discussed beforehand with the team in terms of triaging adverse events. Overall, uh, this procedure is a very safe procedure. And um, however, syncope can occur with patients. So um, recognizing signs of pre-syncope and um, either holding or aborting the procedure in those events and um, laying them flat, um, supplying them some supportive measures is important. Um, so being prepared for that is uh, really key before you embark on incorporating this into your practice if that's your uh, decision. We'll go over some more specific equipment, medications, 1% lidocaine, 4% topical, oximetazoline nasal spray are uh, some kind of basic uh, fundamentals. Of course, there, there can be additional uh, anesthetic sprays that can be used. And uh, very importantly, you need trained staff that's familiar with laryngoscopy to be able to assist. It can be a nurse or medical assistant, but they need to have sufficient experience to help you. Equipment, obviously, some form of injectable, which we'll discuss in more detail. 
some form of visualization, either flexible learning scope or rigid learning scope. Oftentimes that's used, uh, it's better for transoral approach. Um, uh, flexible learning scope can be fiber optic or single use, depending on what's available. Uh, of course, distal chip uh, imaging provides a little more detail, which is helpful. Video monitor um, to connect the laryngoscope to so that you can easily visualize the larynx during the procedure. If you're um, choosing to undertake a transoral approach, you'll need a transoral needle injector and various disposables. <clears throat> there are a number of laryngeal injectables that are uh, on the market these days for off-the-shelf use, as shown here, um, but really for unilateral vocal immobility and paralysis, there are three that uh, we'll concentrate on. Um, collagen products, I previously used Symmetra a good bit, however, are no longer available. And at least in the U.S., uh, these three are FDA approved for uh, indication of unilateral vocal paralysis. Excuse me. Um, the, the latter to uh, rest on is technically not, it's off-label use, but has been used for uh, several, many years now um, uh, safely. So um, this is not exhaustive information or list, but some general information that's helpful guide your choice of injectable. Hyaluronic acid generally has a, a clinical effect and duration of three to six months, usually closer to three. There is a very small risk of severe idiosyncratic inflammatory reaction that can cause notable edema. Um, I haven't uh, encountered this uh, very often myself, um, but it's been reported in the literature. I think it's also dependent on which uh, brand and formulation you choose. Um, tends to be a allergic reaction to a component. Um, calcium hydroxyapatite lasts uh, much longer, closer to 12 months. I typically counsel my patients, um, but it's really key with Kaha to avoid a superficial injection as it cannot be removed um, uh, except surgically uh, once it's set. And then a newer development that was uh, has come out into the market in just the past few years is silk protein microparticle. It's suspended in hyaluronic acid, so referred to as silk HA. This has been promising in a subset of patients and has been shown to have a durable effect beyond 12 months. In fact, I have some patients I've injected now that have um, gone two years with sustained uh, uh, clinical benefit that has not subsided. And the question is, you know, which subset of patients really uh, are able to obtain a, a durable result? That remains to be seen, possibly in younger patients. But again, there is also a small risk of uh, severe um, inflammatory reaction probably related to the HA carrier. So how do we choose what we use? Well, there's a few scenarios that arise and I, I like to think of it as uh, in these three categories. One, it's a new paralysis with unclear prognosis, but possible spontaneous vocal recovery that will really require time to declare if, um, if you're not undergoing laryngeal EMG for further prognostication. In that case, hyaluronic is a hyaluronic acid is a good choice as it uh, matches that time frame well. If it's a new paralysis that is likely permanent but has not had uh, three months yet to um, allow the vocal fold atrophy to naturally um, mature, then it's helpful to use hyaluronic acid to at least get past that three months uh, before you pursue a permanent intervention such as thyroplasty, which uh, I won't get into. And then there's also chronic paralysis uh, uh, with poor prognosis um, for recovery, likely permanent. And while um, permanent surgical options are the mainstay, sometimes kaha or uh, silk can be considered for these patients, um, especially if it's for malignant reasons, palliative, um, older patient with significant risks. There are a multitude of approaches. I'm going to focus on a percutaneous approach that I use as my workhorse approach, um, as I find it's probably the easiest to pick up um, if it is uh, a completely new procedure to you. Transoral approach, um, uh, as it stated, uh, pretty straightforward um, through the mouth, uh, typically done 
either um, with the patient holding their own tongue or you're holding the tongue and assistant holding a flexible ring scope for visualization or uh, the patient holding their own tongue and you can use a rigid laryngoscope and uh, a transoral needle to uh, perform the injection. And the only difference in terms of the anesthetic consideration uh, compared with the percutaneous is usually helpful to have additional anesthetic spray in the oral pharynx. Various percutaneous approaches, thyrohyoid coming from uh, right above the thyrocartilage to the thyrohyoid membrane for which it's named, transthyroid coming through the thyrocartilage and cricothyroid coming through the cricothyroid membrane from below the bulk fold. And then um, more recently with a special catheter developed with silk voice that we can perform endoscopic injections um, as well. So some general supplies that are important here, oxymetazoline uh, lidocaine spray for the nose, 1% lidocaine uh, for uh, subcutaneous uh, anesthesia, usually using a 30 gauge for comfort, 4% topical lidocaine, uh, which is important to have at least two and a half cc's for adequate anesthesia um, on 23 gauge needle. And then also longer 23 gauge needles that are thin walled are helpful for uh, injecting a variety of materials, uh, including haha. -ha. And usually with the thin wall, that allows uh, a little better egress. Hemostat to bend the needle, gauze, alcohol swab. Um, for a thorough higher approach, <clears throat> My preference, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as many others, is to use a double bend. Typically, it's uh, the first bend about a centimeter, a centimeter and a half back from the needle tip, angled from 30 to 45 degrees, depending on whether male or female. Usually female, you can um, angle it less, and then 45 degree bend at the hub. And this aids inferior needle trajectory into the vocal fold once you've pierced through the pedial and entered the endolarynx. And the bend is, um, this first bend is helpful to assess your needle depth as that's a good point of reference. If you're going quirk thyroid, probably just a single bend. Uh, um, preparation anesthesia. So again, some of this is uh, optional, but I, I like to play music during the procedure to help with the patient um, uh, kind of mental state and getting them into a more relaxed state for the procedure. Uh, nasal decongestant anesthesia. Palpation really is key for uh, this procedure, recognizing, recognizing where your landmarks are and making sure you are accurate is uh, really critical. Um, infiltrating the planned trajectory of the needle um, through uh, to the thyroid membrane and back to the skin with 1% lidocaine and then also injecting 1% across the cricothyroid membrane. Um, I put some more on the side of the paralysis in case I need to convert to a cricothyroid approach. And then <clears throat> prior to delivering the, the ringotracheal anesthetic, you want to confirm that all of your equipment as well as your assistant are ready to go as there is a little bit of a time window that we need to consider. And then once you're ready, you can introduce the a uh, needle for the 4% lidocaine through the cricothyroid membrane, pull back to ensure you're getting air bubbles uh, and you're in the airway. And then you need to pinch the needle with your uh, other hand to make sure the needle does not move when you inject it as they will cough. Um, the needle can slip underneath the conus. If you continue injecting, that can cause hemilaryngeal uh, edema from the injectase. So that's really important. That's happened, excuse me, that's happened to me once. Um, from the needle uh, not being stabilized. So a general uh, overview of the thyroid high approach. First, you want your system to obtain a global view of the glottis as well as the pedials. They need to be past the epiglottic tip. You're going to enter the midline um, uh, just above the thyroid notch with the needle, angling the needle downwards at a 45 degree angle. This is important. And then you are going to advance the needle until... Uh, it comes through at the pedial and the first bend is visible. Once that is uh, present, uh, the assistant will advance the scope and rotate so that you can visualize more of the ventricle. I'll show this in the video next. And then placing the needle at the superior arcuate line, the posterior third, the vocal cord, usually to a depth of three to four millimeters is adequate and a slow injection until at a um, interval endpoint. So what that looks like is here. 
we see I palpate first with my finger at the thyroid membrane to confirm at the at, uh, precise location. Here's the needle coming in. The bend is visible and now we're engaging it um, in the posterior vocal fold. Once we're at an adequate depth, slow injection, you'll see um, first the contour becomes straight. There's more augmentation or medialization effect. Um, depending on the material, you, there is some degree of over medialization you have to achieve uh, to obtain a favorable end result once some of the short acting um, carrier component has dissolved. So typically 10 to 20% for um, hyaluronic acid and kaha. Very minimal for silk. I'm going to skip the endoscopic approach, but that's done with the essentially a endoscopic catheter that is newly developed, and you will need to channel the ringoscope to do this. So this is not available for many um, places if you do not have this equipment. So I, I don't want to uh, spend too much time on this. So some pearls and pitfalls, um, you know, beyond what I just mentioned. I think it's really key to uh, prepare adequately for the injection in terms of attention to the patient experience and comfort. Don't rush, you know, it's, um, it, it can go very smoothly or very poorly dependent on patient tolerance. So we want to acknowledge that aspect. We want to make sure you use adequate amount of anesthetic, at least two uh, cc's of 4% if you're delivering transtracheally or if you're doing a gargle or multiple aliquots dripped from above usually you're going to want to use a bit more as some of it's going to be dispersed um, in other locations. Timing what I call the sweet spot, making sure that as soon as laryngotracheal anesthetic is delivered, you're starting the procedure as if the um, patient becomes too numb, they start to develop pretty high secretion burden and makes the procedure more difficult due to uh, visualization difficulties. Injection technique uh, considerations for the thyroid, again, as I mentioned, really confirm, double check that you are where you think you are, um, and also with visual feedback when you enter or when we, you palpate. It's really important to angle the needle immediately inferiorly through the notch and not perpendicular to membrane, otherwise you'll be tethered at the membrane soft tissue. It'll be difficult to get sufficiently inferior. And you want to enter the endolarynx as close as possible to the level of glottis. Avoid entering too high for the same reasons I mentioned above. So if you notice you're too high when you enter, you want to immediately pull back into the soft tissue, redirect, and come more inferiorly. <clears throat> Avoid burying the needle too deeply or laterally out of fear of a superficial injection, as if you're too deep, the injectate will actually just medialize the conus or may go out into the periglottic space. So you do need to really get it right next to the muscle. And if you ever do get any superficial kaha, if it's right, if you notice it right at the time of the injection, typically you can still needle the apex of it and uh, gently manipulate that superficial kaha out with the needle tip. However, if you don't do anything about it and leave it, it will set and that will be um, difficult to rest except surgically. So some outcomes is just an example. When the sunlight strikes, strikes raindrops in the air, they act as a prism and form a rainbow. The rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. So this is a patient with a unilateral paralysis, pretty typical uh, breathy uh, dysphonia with some diplophonia. When the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act as a prism and form a rainbow. So much improved resonance, clarity, reduced breathiness. Um, I typically like to see them four to six weeks afterwards to assess the adequacy of the injection. Occasionally, you may have someone who's under augmented, so you can offer them a booster injection. Or some patients may also have contralateral atrophy that end up resulting in a slightly suboptimal outcome, and you can also do a contralateral injection um, in addition to the booster. And I'll just uh, say uh, from here, that recording, reviewing, and reflecting on um, what you do is really the key to um, navigating the learning curve and growing and honing the skill. Go ahead. Um, 
just from a timing perspective, do you guys want me to go into laryngeal reinnervation or should uh, should we move on? Sorry, it's taking a little bit. I think we could yeah. probably so, proceed. Thank you, you very much. Um, can oh, we oh. can we go to our brigadier and let us uh, have your presentation? I think the point really we need to make is when do you how do you decide you need transcervical approach thyroplasty rather than transoral, and then briefly show your technique what you do. And that's, I think, the main important thing that I would like to know. How do you decide? You have yeah, to do it. Uh, okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Right. Can, uh, can Bill uh, go and uh, uh, speak maybe four or five uh, minutes on re -innervation? So it will be a complete. Uh, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of hit on the highlights here. And in answer to your question, Dr. Oswell, I think um, personally, you know, some of it is preference of I I think the individual performing the procedure and what you're most comfortable with. Um, my uh, workhorse approach is percutaneous thyrohyoid. I think it's great for visualization. It's great for trainees first learning it. Um, and most patients, uh, unless they are obese and have a really thick neck, you will be able to perform it successfully. So my main uh, consideration when I'm considering transoral versus percutaneous is what is the degree of soft tissue um, thickness and obesity that's going to determine whether you can perform percutaneous approach. If there's more soft tissue uh, depth, then you can go for a carcathyroid approach that is closer. Okay, so thank for you. Okay. okay. Shall we go to Brigadier for presentation and then... Bill, Bill's, Bill's going to do one one more short four to yeah. five minute segment, and then we'll yeah. go to Deb Brigadier. Okay. So, so I'll just focus on non selective uh, ANSA to recurrent re innervation, as this is uh, probably the most uh, common approach for unilateral process. And <clears throat> the candidates that are most favorable are generally younger patients. Nerve regeneration um, is more favorable in this cohort. Um, patients who will not tolerate sedation for laryngeal framework surgery are ones that you may want to consider re laryngeal re -innervation. And then also etiologies of paralysis that do not involve prior neck surgery, for example, idiopathic cardiothoracic surgery, as you, um, <clears throat> if there's significant scar and it makes the procedure much more difficult, and you may not have a viable nerve to um, transfer to. Um, another situation that can be helpful is anticipated recurrent laryngeal nerve sacrifice at a time of uh, thyroid surgery for malignancy or intraoperative uh, um, transection that's inadvertent. Um, you can do an immediate nerve transfer. But of course, you need to have an adequate stump or dissect intralaryngeally. This is just Thank a you. brief a look yeah. at um, the anatomy. I'm not going to go into this in detail, but Essentially, the ANSA, as we know, forms a loop. And the key point is the summit of the loop can be found at the junction of omohyoid and SEM. And this is kind of general overview of how this is done. Placing the incision uh, at the level of the cricoid, you're going to dissect in that triangle, as I mentioned, between the omohyoid and the uh, SEM to the carotid sheath. And then Bill, follow the, Bill yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. I think we're okay. running out of time. Yes. Uh, if we can go to the next presentation, and then maybe at the end of the discussion, we may have time. I just had a message from Dr. Gandhi that we're running short of time. Thank you. And I apologize. Yes. Thank you. Brigadier? Yes, sir. Please. please. Uh, can, you, can you tell us brief points of your technique and how do you decide which patient to go for and whatnot? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I Thank am. You. Thank you. Uh, am I visible, sir? Yeah. Okay. Uh, good. Good evening. Good morning. Good afternoon. Wherever you are, in which part of globe you are in. Uh, at the outset, I must uh, say my uh, gratitude to Dr. Oswal. Um, Dr. Brandon and Dr. Sachin for inviting me to give this talk, which is close to my heart. 
because since it is almost 25 years since I've been doing this thyroplasty type one, and uh, I've done at my credit about 287 cases so far. Uh, now, this is the place where I work. Um, this is uh, BLK Max Super Specialty Hospital in New Delhi. And uh, we are we work as a team. This is my colleague, Dr. Niyasud, and uh, she's uh, my partner in the voice clinic. We deal with all the voice cases. Now, let's come to thyroplasty basics because I have been told that uh, I have to tell you people how, I mean, to the audience, how to go about thyroplasty and how it started. Way back in 98, when I was in Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, that time I saw Dr. Dennis Cross doing uh, thyroplasty in uh, recurrent angina palsy. I watched two, three surgeries. And then when I came back to India, I got a got hold of a instructional video of Professor Rishiki. And uh, that fascinated me in thinking about going for thyroplasty. Because till then, nobody had done much work on unilateral vocal fold palsy. So I went on to, uh, we in the armed forces, we have uh, something called AFMRC Armed Forces Medical Research uh, Center. So through that, I applied for a, a, a research project and we started uh, working on thyroplasty. Now, this is a Sir, can you hear the sound? We can hear. Okay, okay. So, uh, the uh, this is to show that the measurements are taken from at the notch, not at this place. This is the superior border and this is the inferior border and the measurement is taken. This is the midpoint and at that level, your window has to be made. So this is particularly for those people who are not much exposed to laryngology, I mean the thyroplasty, like this is the window which we make it and this should be uh, parallel to the lower border. And the anterior border should be about 5 to 6 millimeter away from the midline. And uh, you, we remove the cartilage here and after that the block is inserted. I am coming to that later. Now, as I told you, vertical measurement is taken from upper border to lower border at the level of thyroid notch. Not, uh, not in the in this level, uh, in the ALA level. That's what initially when I started, I kept on reading uh, Dr. Ishiki's uh, original uh, article. And I was always thinking that he is taking from here. But later on, after reading so many times, I realized that that was my first case. So I realized that this is uh, the measurements have to be taken at the level of notch. However, Kaufman, he had uh, published in 91 in the OCNA. He used to take uh, measurement here and used to have a very complex uh, 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 calculation for making the size of the window. Um, now, this is what I am telling. I was telling that uh, this is made on the affected side. The window is made. And this is the continuous red line, which is upper border. And uh, then the lower border that is denoted with the blue one is parallel to the um, lower border of the thyroid cartilage. Now, typically the, uh, in male, the height of the window is about 5 to 6 millimeter. And width is about 12 to 15 millimeter because the male larynx is bigger than female larynx. In case of female, the height is about 4 to 5 millimeter and uh, the uh, width is about 10 to 12 millimeter. Now, coming to different uh, types, see, this is a, a diagrammatical representation of the pillar in the paragonic space, which uh, 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 Will has shown. And this is the uh, implant, cyelastic implant, which is typically placed just lateral to the um, uh, the vocal fold. And this is uh, this denotes uh, this uh, one uh, the arytenoid rotation medially uh, or arytenoid adduction. Now, 
uh, I must tell you the different types of implants, shapes of implants have been made. Typically, type A is of Dr. Ishiki, which has been modified by different people, uh, type B and modified type B by Kaufman, which I really liked it and I have been using modified type B implant only. The other implants, they don't uh, find much mention in the literature. Now, changes in the implant system. Uh, see, over the years, uh, in the last 25 years, I've seen a lot of people have come up with uh, different ideas and kept on uh, changing the implants. This is Montgomery implant, which is very easy to insert, but is very costly and which is actually beyond our budget for the patient. So I have not used, to be honest with you. Uh, Metrovilla implant is again it, uh, a little costly. I have used in uh, three cases and uh, three cases I've used this implant. I found good results, but it is, again, it is costly. And because I was always in the pursuit of uh, finding out a cheaper implant so that the patient can get uh, maximum benefit with minimum expenditure. This is Viacom implant. Viacom implant is again uh, the very difficult one, which is not available in India. And uh, the insertion is uh, very typical. And here there is a locking mechanism, which I don't know. And Gore-Tex, uh, this is available usually in our cardiothoracic department. We get Gore-Tex and you cut uh, into 3mm wide strips to use it and put it inside in a, through a small window at the level of vocal fold and keep on inserting this, uh, this uh, thin strip till you get desired um, desired medialization like this. It will be just like this. You know? uh, uh, to be honest with you, till one, two years back, I was not using Gore-Tex much. But since last two years, I really started liking Gore-Tex because I was afraid of migration, which is known to occur in case of Gore-Tex. But I found out a technique how to take uh, suture all around and secure it with the cartilage so that migration is minimized, which I'll be showing in my videos. Then comes TVFMI. TVFMI has been invented by, uh, rather uh, designed by Professor Frederick, Gerald Frederick of Austria. And uh, this is very nice implant. And uh, we have used about in more than 50 cases. Uh, we have run a you know, we have done a research project also on this. I'll be mentioning about it soon. This is again costly, but uh, the ease of insertion is very good and only this pliers is required, nothing else. And uh, the measurement should be perfect because only you can bend the implant once. You cannot bend, uh, re-bend again and uh, bend it again. It can't be done. It will break. So, but it uh, it is always secured with the Prolin suture, which I'll be showing you in my video, and uh, there is no chance of exposure. This is one, one of our patients. See, this is the prolin suture, which is non absorbable. We use it for securing the um, implant. Now comes arytenoid adduction. Um, sorry, this uh, something happened. What? Uh, Professor Ishiki, he dislocated the thyroid muscle, uh, thyroid joint, and uh, pushed uh, uh, one second, uh, pushed uh, upwards and uh, approached the muscular process of the arytenoid, uh, uh, muscular process of the arytenoid. Whereas uh, Maragas, he developed a new technique. He did what he did was posteriorly he made a window like this. And here you are directly on the muscular process of the um, arytenoid cartilage. And from here, you take the prolin suture and bring it anteriorly so that it can be rotated. I'll be showing you in my video. Now, what are the advantages of type 1? Because the, uh, the operation is restricted to external laryngeal framework, thus preventing scarring of endolaris is a totally reversible procedure and a very safe procedure. Uh, there's hardly any chance of um, 
uh, any anything wrong happening. However, some people have reported hematoma, uh, which can lead to airway obstruction and tracheostomy. Um, so far, uh, if you are careful, you can avoid it. Quality of voice production is far superior than injection procedure. Now, arachnoid direction why? Larynx consists of uh, two biomechanical subunits. One is anterior, another one is posterior. The anterior one is membranous, posterior one is cartilaginous. So, uh, if there is a posterior glottic gap, then uh, only uh, only doing uh, medialization thyroplasty will not help. There will be still a big glottic gap. So, for this, arachnoid direction is very much essential. Uh, this is Marcus window, which I was telling you about. This is another graphical form. Sorry, if this is uh, Ishiki's procedure, which uh, which I was mentioning you that thyroarytenoid um, uh, dislocation and then uh, the muscular process uh, is identified from there. The suture is taken and brought anteriorly. And this actually mimics the lateral uh, cricoarytenoid uh, muscle so that uh, the arytenoid rotates. Now, Uh, this is one of the video which I have. Uh, sorry, I'll... Uh, I have borrowed from my colleague Dr. Neha. Mm, now this has been edited by me only. So after infiltrating and after the surface parking, we give the incision more on the affected side. In this case, it is more on the right side. So we give a horizontal incision and then deepened then we raise the subplatysmal flaps to expose the strap muscles once that is done the strap muscles are uh, separated in the midline and uh, they are retracted with uh, 2 o silk so that your uh, ally is uh, completely open I hope I am audible. Hello. You are. You can hear you. Yeah. Okay. We Thank can you. hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you are. Yes. Okay. Um, this is uh, the measurement is being taken at the window, upper border and lower border at the level of uh, thyroid notch. And we find out the mid one. And then I I use uh, cautery to make the point because if you use uh, the pen, uh, it doesn't stay there. So I use always the cautery to mark. And I'm using a corneal caliper because corneal caliper gives excellent precise uh, uh, measurement. So the way I told you, this is how the marking is done. And later on, instead of using the marking pen, I use cautery um, and uh, in the cutting mode, and at a low intensity to mark the window. This video I'm going to show, uh, going to show fully because this is the basic uh, type of thyroplasty which is practiced worldwide everywhere using silicon block or silastic block. And you can see the way it is being marked. And once this is done, using 15 number blade, we try to carve out uh, cartilage. And in case you find that there is an ossification of the cartilage, then you can use a burr uh, with 3 mm drill bit. Then uh, gradually the cartilage is elevated using a thin freer elevator and gradually it has to be taken out then next step is using the freer elevator or the circular knife rosen circular knife uh, which we use in ear um, ear surgery we elevate the inner perichondrium until this juncture we don't cut inner perichondrium however 
and uh, as per ishiki you are not supposed to cut the uh, inner pericardium but after listening to general frederick at pune um i came to mind he said that superiorly posteriorly and inferiorly you must cut the fascia uh, the inner pericardium sorry not fascia inner pericardium without breaching the fascia because if you breach the fascia there will be risk bleeding so that you have to avoid so you give a incision in the inner pericardium superiorly posteriorly and inferiorly how does that help it facilitates in pushing the implant very easily otherwise an intact um, pericardium inner pericardium scenario placing the implant is very very difficult i used to struggle a lot in first uh, 25 30 cases and later on after listening to general frederick i changed my um, way this is the cylindric block from which uh, we are carving out a uh, modified type b implant you can see precisely how it is done see if the window is 10 by 5 then it should be the length of the uh, this thing should be 10 plus 2 plus 2 2 anteriorly and 2 posteriorly and 5 mm is a uh, one uh, uh, width and then depth at least 7 mm it should go inside 7 to 8 mm later on you can trim it now we give a scoring like this so that the uh, implant can be bent very easily next placing of the implant first insert the posterior one that is very important posteriorly once you insert uh, because the posterior part of the cartilage is also very thick and our depth is also uh, very big in case of the implant however anteriorly is only 2 mm so it can be easily pushed by bending the way we are doing now first hold it and push it now this is firmly placed now my colleague is uh, seeing the perfect medialization this is now being secured with 3o prolin with the cartridge so that the extrusion doesn't occur Then typically we place uh, a small drain, either uh, Penrose drain or we put uh, Romovac uh, drain, Romovac mini vac. Sorry, this is the mini vac, and we put it and we close it in uh, two layers and uh, and uh, two layers. Okay. Next is TVFMI. Brigadier, Brigadier. Sir, sir. Can you, we're running out of time. Yeah. just got a uh, message from so can you sum up your presentation sir, 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 your just give it and, two, just yeah. give me two minutes just two yeah. minutes yeah. i'll just yeah. show the yeah. uh, basic things yes yes see this uh, here i'm doing arytno direction here i'm cutting the strap passes which is very essential in case of arytno direction now once the uh, strap passes are cut then we do the window and then go for uh, window uh, cutting and uh, cut the inner pericardium and this is the posterior margus window which we have been doing and uh, then prolin suture is taken and uh, figure eight suture through arytenoid so and it is brought out anteriorly like this and after that this is the tvfmi it is inserted because with simple arytenoid direction you will get very good voice however to sustain it you have to use uh, implant so we put tvfmi this is the tvfmi and we bring it out just 2 minutes sir closer and uh, well, now this is uh, quickly this fellow he had a ca uh, thyroid and he we did a we did a type for cordectomy following which following which you can see there is no uh, mass so in this case i didn't want to use uh, any implant because it will extrude so we used um, after 2 years of stimulation we used uh, gotex this is uh, a small window is made at 6 by 10 mm and then we cut it and we are using this is the gotex it is given the manner as i told you 
um, keep the inserting and water insertion we are securing it with a proline suture so that it doesn't migrate and then we close it now this is almost done and this is one or two uh, i just wanted to and uh, this was post op anji mera naam and uh, this one where you can see the posterior glottic gap fuse and this is the guy mera naam narish and uh, this one is uh, after aretization and this is his voice later on and Mira this is one case Narisha. where we had done gotex this is the unit and mera uh, naam kamla hai mera naam kamla hai abhi surgery hui hai do ghante pehle ab mera and uh, 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 sir one second i just want to you were talking hmm. about uh, arytenoid fixation this hmm. case uh, when he came to us he came with uh, wish of hopefulness and uh, <coughs> hmm. i'm going to so, take a lie uh, really of chest here calcut you see the arytenoid is not moving at all we tried uh, probing it from through endoscopically but we could not find then we found the history a fish bone was lying in his throat for about one month in the pyrophosphorus medial wall and here what we did we did simply a uh, uh, medialization thyroplasty we could not do any arytenoid procedure whereas it was required and this is the thing. okay uh, i am colonel tapan kumar lahiri so uh, as you raised issues which are the best one silicon block tbfma gotex i well, feel that silicon block is the best because it is very cheap we carried out a study and we found the silicon block is almost one fifth of the cost of tbfma or other material other uh, procedures and whether to do overcorrect or undercorrect we always prefer to do overcorrect because if you do undercorrect later on there will be problem with his uh, aponia will uh, <coughs> come back and arytenoidization is it must in all cases of uvfp no some people some authors have uh, advocated for arytenoidization in all cases whereas we are very selective in only about 25% uh, cases we have done arytenoidization thank, thank you very much that's it sir thank you very much very okay here now uh, achin gandhi uh, just had a phone call okay uh, uh, we are ready prem एवरीबॉडी we we'll just go through what are the the steps of how we harvest the fat and advantages disadvantages we'll start with the video clips yeah so what does the injection laryngoposterol modulation does mainly how it differs from thyroplasty it also gives bulk to the vocalis muscle not only medializes but gives bulk to the vocalis muscle which is atrophied so it improves voice and swallowing again brunings described autologous fat injection uh, in 1919 and it was mckellian was the first to describe autologous fat augmentation in 1990s this is actually a case of left vocal cord palsy now on video laryngoscopy what do we observe so that we can individually correct those abnormalities so this is on a stroboscopy left vocal cord palsy so ophonetry gap false cord edema hypertrophy if you can see 
there is always augmented or prominent mucosal wave on the side of the paralysis because there is a loss of muscle tension and you can see this again so false cord hypertrophy because of the quality gap see the mucosal waves on the paralyzed side For loss of tension gives this prominent mucosal waves. Then there is force shortening of the array epiglottic fold. See the force shortening of the array epiglottic fold because this has been for more than one or two years. There is always going to be a compensation which would result in hyperreduction and force shortening of the array epiglottic folds. So these we have to correct. Now, main question, when to correct, when to operate surgically these patients of vocal cord palsy? Generally speaking, we should always wait for about nine months for spontaneous recovery. You can do this under electromyographic guidance or monitoring, but professional voice users, young patients, can opt for surgical intervention within short period, maybe uh, two, three, four weeks, or even one or two months, they can opt for surgical intervention. In these cases, fat augmentation would be better than doing a thyroplasty because of chances of recovery of the uh, movement of the recurrent laryngeal nerve or uh, recovery of the recurrent laryngeal nerve function. Now, just to distinguish when to do what. So, generally speaking, a phonetry gap which is less than 2 millimeters, we can go in for autologous fat augmentation or other fillers with injection laryngoplasty. Other methods of uh, uh, injection laryngoplasty, as Bill has already shown, that is done under LA, whereas fat augmentation should be done under GA in majority of the cases. Thyroplasty, when the phonetry gap is more than 2 millimeters. So generally, these are chronic cases. So when it is a large phonetry gap, we opt for thyroplasty 1, medialization thyroplasty. How you differentiate between transcutaneous and transular surgeries? In transcutaneous, less amount of fillers can be injected, 0.5 to 0.8 cc, whereas transorally you can go up to 1.5 uh, ml. Again, which are the patients who would be selected than transoral surgery for transcutaneous or outpatient? Uh, fillers or injection laryngoplasty is again palliative care for head neck malignancies. Patients who are high risk for general anesthesia, patients with restricted mouth opening and restricted neck extension. These are various materials available. The autograph mainly the autologous fat, and some people have started using or medializing with fascia also. Autologous fat, what are the advantages? It is easy to harvest, reliable, sustained action, no tissue rejection or inflammation being autologous, and effects are long lasting. Now, why I say they are long lasting? Scientifically, we can always explain them with the adipose stem cells, the injected tissue remains in the paralyzed cord, angiogenesis, and of course there is another reason, there is always going to be early compensation by the opposite vocal cord. 
Now we'll go to the technique with video clips. So how we harvest the fat? So it is by surgical incision. We do it on the paraamical umbilical uh, region. Again, only going to be small as possible. Maybe this could be another disadvantage apart from GA. There is a scar, the surgical scar could be another disadvantage of this procedure. But apart from that, we go on to the positive side as well, you know, for the slides. The fat harvesting we always do under local anesthesia, then process it. And then after processing, we ask the anesthetist to induce the patient. How we process the fat? First, we separate the connective tissue from the fat globules. Then we mix it with either insulin or protein-rich plasma, which add to the growth factors. The fat globules are processed in pestle and mortal, but very gently. We prepare a pest mix it with PRP or insulin. This is loaded into a tuberculin syringe and then either the Brodings needle or the needle which I'm going to show which we have uh, developed. And with that, we inject the fat into the paralyzed vocal cord. Once the fat processing is completed, then we ask the anesthetist to induce the patient. Just to differentiate between various procedures, the commonest being used is liposuction and centrifugation. How it differs from surgical excision and the method which I have explained is basically this damage to the viable adipocytes due to the mechanical pressure of the centrifugation. So absolutely this destroys the adipocytes and the number is less to regrow again. So number of stem cells and growth factors is also reduced because of this procedure of centrifugation. That's how this procedure which I have developed or we practice differs from uh, the commonly seen in various institutes that is centrifugation or liposuction. How we inject the fat? Patient is taken under general anesthesia but it's a tubeless anesthesia because there is no pressure of the tube. The cords are relaxed. They are not put under tension. Now you can see this is atrophic muscle in which I'm injecting the fat anterior to the vocal process. Around 1.5 cc or ml is injected into the vocal fold. We always process the midline which would mean that we are injecting 30% more. So it is always an overcorrection. Now, when you remove the needle, it can be sealed with the help of laser here. So you can see the overcorrection around 30% more. Now, instead of a microscope, we use a endoscope, either a sinus endoscope or a laparoscope through the direct laryngoscope which gives good alignment and there is also a perception of the depth in which we inject the uh, fat in, with the needle. And always, as I said, you should inject the direct laryngoscope giving relaxation to the cord because you insert the direct laryngoscope more on the vocal cords. The vocal cords are tensed and there is less muscle mass to inject. So these are the precautions we take during injection. Now, this is a biological properties which help in maybe long lasting effect. So, there is always a zone of angiogenesis, there is always a zone of regeneration because of the stem cells. There is a zone of ischemia, but the cells grow or continue to grow centripetally, so from outside towards the center. So there is always going to be uh, 
this zone of ischemia, this tissue is always going to be replaced slowly by growth of the new cells. Role of platelet plasma or PRP, what we say, uh, it consists of basically growth factors, improves fat tissue viability by increasing the angiogenesis, it gives again long lasting results. How does the insulin act when we mix it into the fat? It prevents lipolysis by stabilizing the flat globules cell membrane, basically, and again, uh, production of the mature adipocytes. Now, surgical outcome, what we will get is basically closure of the clotic uh, aperture in the anterior two-thirds. It improves the maximum phonation time, which is very important. It improves the hoarseness because there is a closure. Quality of voice improves and basically because of the closure of both the vocal cords, patient can increase the subglottic pressure, which increases the loudness of the patient. It offers bulk to the vocal cord and which improves the frequency. This is how it differs from the thyroplasty, which allows only medialization. It maintains the mucosal wave. Again, post radiation scarring or scarred vocal folds, the results would be poor. How the recovery, how you are injected the fat, how the patient is going to react. So this is pre-op stroboscopy. I mean, we have already seen this. After one week, we can see good approximation. But there are no mucosal waves here. So the quality would not be good enough. But see the good approximation. And patient is always going to feel some heaviness in the throat. Now, within three to four weeks, that is after one month, the mucosal waves are going to come back or come back. So, recovery of the mucosal wave and that going to improve the quality of voice. The patient is again going to go back to near normal voice. See the mucosal waves. Now, these are a long term report again. So this is pre-op. This is after one week. Again, good closure, good approximation, but no mucosal waves. And this is after six months. So the mucosal waves have recovered quite well, and it has improved the voice. Right? Nicely. <coughs> so recovery of the mucosal wave takes for about four weeks, and that's how you have to always consult the patient. It's going to take four weeks to get your uh, normal voice. These are again long term results. So, again, this is pre op. After five years. See the mucosal waves were quite good. Approximation is also quite nice. Now, best to check what really happens after five years to the fat globules we have injected. So we do MRI of these patients, and it shows hypointense image. So there are fat globules which still present after five to ten years of fat augmentation. So we have started doing. Uh, MRI to see really is it a fibrosis, it is, a, is it a good compensation or there are still fat globules which are present and which really gives better approximation and voice to the patient. There are roles of uh, multiple uh, investigations. One of them is electromyography, just 
to monitor the recovery, establish pro uh, prognosis and surgical outcomes, which we have actually started doing in our department. Voice analysis and the most uh, commonly we use is maximum phonation time, the fundamental frequency, and the realism in the noise to harmonics ratio. Again, you can do pulmonary function test for these patients, which will show this. Why pulmonary function test? Again, to check uh, the phonetic gap, the leak of air, the subglottic pressure, and again, the edema of the false vocal cords, which may give breathlessness in a long standing cases. So, we have started doing this in our clinics. Another indication of chordae, uh, uh, autologous file augmentation would be in the chordectomy patients. We do type 3 chordectomy in which bulk of the vocalis muscle is removed. And then we inject fat, maybe 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 mm. So this is intraoperative. And this is postoperative clip. So we have done around 21 patients and they have shown significant improvement which has already been published. What are the risk factors? Now you have to always check the position of the injection and depth of the needle. If depth is too deep, then it's going to go into most of the subglottis. Patient may have a strider for a few hours after the surgery. If above, then maybe Supraglottis, see, you can see the hypertrophy of the ventricular band here. You can compare it with opposite sides. So it's in the supraglottic space. It can go in two cases are reported, not nine, but they are reported. It can go subcutaneously into the neck also, it can just travel down. What to do for these cases? Just maintain the strider, monitor the strider with nebulization and steroids. And generally within three to four weeks, every day, thing is taken care of and it will work as long. So advantages, again, fast results, uh, no foreign body reaction, but again, it is under general anesthesia, maybe not irreversible. Few cases with breathing difficulty just after the surgery, exclusion of fat, and of course, mainly surgical scar, especially for young female patients at the donor side. A few papers, long-term results. So in 2011, I, paid, I published uh, the first paper. I followed 30 patients for six months. Video laryngoscopy analysis, one, three, and six months, and significant improvement in around 82% of cases. Another paper in January 2019, around 60 patients we followed up, and the follow-up was more than 12 months. Significant improvement in all the parameters. In 2021, I did high speed imaging of these patients. We followed 39 patients now for more than four years, 48 months. And again, similar nomenclature, the results were quite good in around 80% of the patients. Generally, this is under publication. We have done around 527 cases in 2018 around more than 300 cases for five years, 210 cases for more than 10 years, followed by VLS voice analysis and MRI scan in 50 patients. Around 78% cases showed improvement on perceptual evaluation, subjective evaluation, and again, objective analysis with assessment with voice analysis. So these are my publications on this topic. I think I will thank you everyone for listening to these talks and presentations. I will uh, announce the next session, which would be there after three months in the month of November, the third Saturday, and it will be on laryngopharyngeal reflux and arytenoid granuloma. You will get all the emails and give WhatsApp messages, ventilation of the program. Thank you all again.
and please request the Mr. Oswal to announce the uh, closure of this session. Sachin, thank you very much. You know, there are so many beautiful presentations here and I would love to have, based on presentation, advanced discussion on various topics that we talked about. Uh, there's some senior surgeons might be watching, middle grade surgeons might be watching. They're doing the work and there are many methods that we saw. Uh, heart augmentation doesn't cost any money and its long-term results are pretty good. One of the questions uh, is raised is mucosal wave. None of the other presenters discussed about mucosal wave, which seems to be important for the quality of voice after your surgery, whether it's preserved after your surgery that you do with um, calcium hydroxyapatite or cell protein. These are the issues that I think at an advanced level we should discuss. Maybe I would uh, draft 10 questions for our uh, faculty and then you write to me those questions and then we might publish it on our website or something like that because there are tremendously important uh, questions. This is a, such a common uh, occurrence of, you know, of palsy that uh, we need to address uh, this kind of advanced question because there's no time, there's never is enough time. And therefore, maybe uh, Sachin and I would discuss Brandon and ourselves and say, if we can follow it through by simply typed question, put on a website, and this is what the outcome of this, uh, this course is. So thank you very much for your interesting topic covering various methods. There's never one way, a definite way in medicine. There's always what you believe is the right way. What is available in the market or uh, in the country to use. How much advanced technology you have to take example take a help of electromyography to decide which uh, patient should have what. And finally, this is not patient-oriented talk. We should have a little bit of patient-oriented talk as well, in the sense that patient's requirements that he wants the voice tomorrow or a housewife who doesn't bother about the voice Maybe say, okay, I'm waiting for nine months. But in the meantime, what can you do for me? So these are the practical issues. I would like all of you to consider the patients oriented, patient oriented, uh, some sort of medical practice that you would like, or you are, I'm sure you're doing it. But I think it will be nice to have that angle as well, because in the end, that's what matters. Not your, not your expertise, your expert, your specialist, you're well-trained. You show everything what you show. But if I'm sitting as a patient, I'm confused. <laughs> Am I going to have outside or inside or what? All that I want is my voice back, please, doctor. Do whatever you want. I got a meeting a week later, I'm an uh, uh, executive. What can you do for me? Sachin Gandhi will say, I do your part immediately, quickly. So these are the issues that we should discuss about sometime. There's no time, but maybe we should think about a follow-up of 45 minutes of discussion based on a lot of questions. The audience may have a lot of questions to ask, but we are falling short of that side of it, okay? For a very good reason. There's no time. So maybe we should think about uh, Randon, we should think about that and see what follow-up we can provide on a on a website. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you, Bill. Nice presentation. Yeah. Nice presentation. Brandon, practical. Brigadier, of course, I can't say more about Brigadier. He has a mature hand. And Gandhi <laughs> has a good, uh, good follow-up case. I like your cases. Good follow-up cases. And I like the idea about Mikosa Wave. So, I don't know if the mucosal wave goes after paralysis or what. Because mucosal wave is dependent on airflow. It's not dependent on the muscular backup. You know, air, mucosa is mucosa, muscle is muscle. 
I what fully agree. Hmm? I fully agree with you. In yeah. my case, no. in the long term follow up, the yeah. mucosal wave is always intact. They are yeah. never gone. These are the issues that I like to understand. That Sachin Gandhi's case is, you know, why mucosal wave mm -hmm. did not come immediately? I don't know. Uh, these are the kind of, maybe inflammatory process stops it. From the team, uh, That's quite yeah. likely. That's quite yeah. likely. So, thank you again. Have a nice weekend, and we'll see you in three months. In in uh, Urdu, they say Inshallah, means God willing. <laughs> thank okay. You, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Brandon. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. Okay. Bye, sir. We'll talk. Thank you, Sachin. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Brigadier. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Dr. Oswal, sir. Yeah. I'll connect with you later, sir. Dr. Oswal. Oswal, sir. I'll connect with you later. Thank you.